And, you know, I spend enough time in the Netherlands that I can I can tell you definitively they have plenty of space, you know, they have plenty of facilities that are shared facilities with bikes and peds. And what are they? They're wider. If you go into Vondel Park, it's hugely wide. And there's and, and lots why, and lots of people. Yeah. And, and let's go to Finland. Why does Olu, why do they have such an, an amazing maintenance program? Because it's wide. They can drive a big tractor through there multiple right. times every hour. Simple, done. Don't have to buy these these small little. Oh yeah, we bought this mini snowplow. No, forget that. Just use the use the maintenance equipment you already have. Uh, that saves money, right? But right. just make your bike and ped facilities wider. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns Channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that, of course, is my friend Brandon Luss. American Pizza out on Twitter. Uh, wonderful having him back on the podcast for the third time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brandon, for doing that. Hey, it's a good one, folks, and it's a long one. So let's get right to it with Brandon Lust. Brandon Lust, welcome back. <laughs> hey, John. <laughs> good to see you, buddy. Good to what see you, you too. To, man? Yeah. Yeah. What you been up to? What have I been up to? Um, feeting, walking on my features, and yeah, that's about it. Yeah. 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 And I understand you're batching it these days right now. Yep. My wife's in India for the next month. Well, India and Singapore. And then she'll she'll get home in the middle of end of May and go to Canada. So just me <laughs> and the cats sitting around. Um, just you and the cats sitting around. Doing cat stuff, yeah. That's so funny. Um, so you actually did post something uh, just recently, um, you know, from Tatiana, um, because like you said, she's she's over there in India. And uh, oh, yeah. yeah, what does she do? She <laughs> get, set us up. What, what is what is why did she send you this photo? Yeah, I was just stepping out on her hotel balcony and looking out and seeing parked cars and a highway and multi-level parked cars and just commenting that, well, there's lots of car and car infrastructure. I'm like, uh oh, you know, I, uh, I'm a broken record everywhere we go. It's me commenting, oh, geez, cars, oh, roads. <laughs> or, and after a few years, I guess that rubs off on other people. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you can fly, I don't know, what she got like 17 hours total in flying to get there and go to the other side of the yeah. world and bam, cars. Yeah, cars. Boom. Yeah. Well, it's, it, we're, we're joking a little bit about, you know, about the, the fact that Tatiana, yeah, you know, sends you a photo and it's just like, ah, exasperation cars. But I mean, you know, the, the, the wonderful thing is, is she's been on the podcast before for those uh, that may not be aware of this. And we talked about her story, a very, very inspiring story, actually, about uh, bikes and how that really kind of changed her life. Talk yeah. about that just a little bit. Yeah. You know, something that does spring to mind, which I think is going to resonate with a lot of people, but probably people who start to get their children to ride bikes with them, you know, uh, we don't have kids, but I got Tatiana on a, on a bike as an adult and got her on an e-bike and she rides more and go places. But I've noticed that something that kind of ruins things for me now is that Anytime we go somewhere together, I'm, I'm almost real too preoccupied with her safety. Uh, not, not for how she can handle herself on a bike because she's gotten really good at her skills and, and everything like that. But I'm worried about other people in cars, primarily, of course, uh, not looking out for her. So I, I spend most of my time anxious and blood pressure spiked because I'm looking behind me and looking over here and just trying to make sure, okay, I crossed this roundabout. Uh, did I block traffic enough or get people's attention so that they're going to see her too? And um, I just noticed that that's gotten worse with me over time. The more that she does go places with me, I, I worry. And, and I'm sure that people that ride with their children and other, and maybe even their spouses or their partner, whatever, even their friends who aren't so confident on bikes, Sure, they have the same issues and it's just another thing of, you know, I don't know, here I am going off on a tangent already, but electric cars aren't the answer. Cars are cars and cars will always be the problem. I, I don't, 
getting smashed by a, a fossil fuel car over a an EV is the same thing to me. And having them all be threats, it's it's the same thing. Getting off my soapbox too early. Okay, next. <laughs> Well, I, I, and I suppose we should we should actually pause just a little bit to give you a proper introduction in the sense that, you know, you are the American Feetzer. And oh, so, yeah. you know, we didn't even mention that and uh, and that yeah. makes mentioning uh, because, you know, that's that's how we met is, you know, out on Twitter. And, uh, you know, that's that's really your primary presence out out on the interwebs is, you know, mm-hmm. this particular identity. And and uh, I can't remember where you were at. Uh, during our last uh, interview for the podcast, is it? Does it make sense <laughs> that it was around ten thousand subscribers? Yeah, it was. Then? It was just about ready to tick over on ten thousand. And what was that uh, last year? Yeah, it or, or it may have been longer than last year. Yeah, I mean, it, it may have been a little more than a no. year, but. Yeah, I think it was crazy. last year because the first one, yeah. for our first interview was 2021. Next one yep. was 2022, and now 20. Yep. Yeah, so it went from ten thousand to yep. over thirty. Yeah really wow. fast, which blows my mind. Um, yeah. and, and I know that sometimes I forget that, you know, not everybody knows the story of how my advocacy and I came about in this whole space. Yeah. Um, yeah. we'll take, because take been, a, a few, uh, take 30 seconds and, and, you know, do it. I mean, we'll, we'll encourage people, obviously, you know, please go, go watch the first one, uh, you know, uh, of Brandon giving the real backstory and you were still living in Minnesota at that point in time. Uh, yeah. and then, yeah, the second one, when we really honed in on Carmel, Indiana, which is where you moved to, but then we really shifted gears and talked about, uh, other influences online that you were very, very interested in, but yeah, take like 30 seconds and just give a, a little, uh, background to, uh, to yourself and, and this sure. identity. Yeah. Your alias. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, the first one was audio only. Uh, we hadn't that's done right. video yeah. yet. So, yeah, that's true. um, so my, my whole thing start, I, you know, my backgrounds in farming, uh, agriculture, I, I still hold a, a CDL, a commercial driver's license. I can drive semis. I've spent most of my life in combines and tractors and big trucks and diesels and everything like that. Driving, 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 um, in 2017, got on an airplane to go to the Netherlands for the first time because my wife had to go there for work. Got her careers. It was just paying off. Uh, and I wasn't really that excited, to be honest, but I just thought, well, let's go see what this is about. And that was my life-changing moment. I, I got off the plane, got on a train. I never set foot in a car. And the whole time there, I never thought about cars. And this is the first time in my life I had ever had my mind shifted to, oh my, whoa, you can walk places, you can ride bikes places, you can take trams and trains and that actually works. That's not just some hippie garbage, you know, no, it works. And ever since then, I just dove down a rabbit hole. I had no Twitter following. I didn't do anything on Twitter, to be quite honest. Uh, Dove down a rabbit hole and just learned and learned and learned about the Netherlands. I was, um, I was watching uh, um, on YouTube, MobyCon, uh, y'all should look those up, uh, and learning about infrastructure design because uh, they they taught me everything I know, that and like Bicycle Dutch and other people like that. Um, and so I gained all my education and inspiration through there and ran with it. And um, even in 2019, when I went back to the Netherlands to go meet up with Bicycle Dutch, um, my Twitter had like 200 followers. I didn't do much. And so from 2019 to today, ticked over 30,000 because apparently I know some things and I'm able to inspire some people, teach some lessons. And also I try to keep things fun too. I'm not, I'm not Mr. Serious. And I'm also, um, I don't know, sometimes a little salty, but but, uh, I I try to keep advocacy fun, but where people are learning and people are being inspired and it's resonating with people, obviously, otherwise I would have quit by now. So yeah. Um, yeah, here we are. That's American beats. Beats her. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and explain, uh, the, the name. Ah, uh, yeah. Beats her. Well, I'm not a cyclist. Um, I don't even particularly like bikes that much, but I like what they do and how they do it. I do have a particular interest now in cargo bikes and electric cargo bikes and e-bikes. Um, but, uh, 
Yeah, I'm a feetser, not a cyclist, and that's that's hard for me to to uh, point out the difference uh, here yeah. on demand. Well, I mean, uh, it's it, I mean the 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 reason and the base of of that you know, kind of points to the Dutch, the Dutch have two different words for yes. a cyclist, you know, somebody who rides a bike, you know, they're the feetser is just somebody who's on a bike doing everyday things. And it's a veal practical. Runner, yeah. yeah. And a veal, a veal, a veal runner, which is, or wheel runner, which means you're, mm-hmm. you're a sports cyclist. You're somebody who's doing it for recreation or for sport. And, and by the way, the Dutch are amazing at racing. I mean, they, you know, have, uh, a very, very rich history, uh, of winning, uh, big time races all over the world. And so that's, that's kind of the difference. A uh, feature is just somebody who gets around. Yeah. Doesn't even yeah, think so about it. it. Yeah. Exactly Pedestrian that plus. people. Yeah. It, it's all yeah. up here. It's just that yeah. sometimes when I, when my mouth starts running, my brain has a hard time catching up. So yeah. thanks, uh, John, you illustrated, uh, you put that out there just perfectly. Yes. <laughs> just perfect. Um, yeah. So I'm a feature and, and I see bikes are tools. They're utilitarian. They help me get from A to B and, and accomplish everyday life tasks that you would do with a car, but I can do it with electric cargo bikes. That's my enabler, not a, not a road bike, not a mountain bike. Those do nothing for me, but an electric cargo bike makes it so that my car sits in the garage and collects dust because we're still car light. Yeah. Uh, and then I threw American in front of it because, well, as much as I hate labeling myself to the to this country sometimes, uh, <laughs> I live in the U.S. So American for those the, for network. those who follow you, they know they can relate. They know. You, you are yes. a bit exasperated from time to time. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned you try to keep things fun, so uh, we do have a few f- uh, questions that came in from the audience ahead of time uh, for recording mm-hmm. this. So um, I'm going to put a fun one up right away uh, here. So I'm going to pop it in and and actually bring it down out of our faces here. And, uh, this is, this is kind of fun, you know? So, uh, yeah. So, gee, so, so what is your favorite type of cheese and, and why is it Gouda? Wink, well, first wink, of all, know. it's not Gouda, it's Chalda. Exactly. I think that's part of the joke. <laughs> uh, no, Gruyere. Yes. Always Gruyere. There you go. Like Boom. That, that was, that was actually my gateway cheese because, uh, you know, back in the day before I was more cultured and experienced, I just, I knew all the craft garbage that they have in the American grocery stores of cheddar and well, Fiesta and whatever else they label that crap. And yeah. then, uh, then I think I had fondue one time and I was like, what is this cheese? And they said, well, it's Emmentaler, which if that's how you say it, I don't know. And, and, uh, yeah. Gruyere. And so th- that's Gruyere is my go-to. Sorry. Okay. No, how yeah, yeah, no how to, yes. <laughs> so uh, we did get a few few other fun questions uh, coming in, and I think you know probably uh, this this kind of you know relates back to to your wife Tatiana as well in, in the sense of when she started to to ride her bike more frequently um, and for everyday purposes, you know, suddenly it was you know, the weather didn't really matter as much. You know, it, it's like she would be riding when it was raining, you're riding when it's raining. If it's cold, you're doing that. And so that's, you know, one of the questions that came in was what are some of the tips that you have for riding, uh, in cold climates? And, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that. Uh, but just in general right now, before we get into any specifics, uh, some cold weather, you know, climate sort of uh, tips that you have. Yeah, let's talk about that um, because I had to learn that on a trial and error basis living in Minnesota where it's cold. I mean, real cold, yeah. not not down here like in Indiana where it's, you know, slightly below freezing and everyone's losing their mind. No, up there it's really cold. So the first winter I, I actually gave things a go with my work cycles freight and there was snow on the ground and it was freezing outside. I was, I was struggling with, um, hands. So I was ordering, geez, I was, you know, ordered a $15 pair of gloves failed. I ordered a $150 pair of gloves failed. And that was actually one of my scariest times. I had these fancy gloves. I thought, okay, I'm good. Uh, I got about, you know, five, six kilometers away from home and I couldn't feel my fingers anymore. And I was, I was scared to death. 
I was riding back as quickly as I could without falling down. And I just, it was creeping up my hands. I couldn't feel my fingers and scared me to death. And I just realized gloves aren't going to do it. So I had to start looking for more alternatives and started talking to people that live in cold climates and came up with a solution. And you can kind of see some of them now. So these are called Fietsmoffen, uh, I think in Dutch, uh, but in German as well, I think. Um, uh, what do we call, what do we call them here? Uh, the pogies? Pogies. 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 Yeah. 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 Um, so I, I, that. You're asking right a guy there, in Texas? <laughs> <laughs> those, those right there, John, uh, those are the ones that Tatiana has. We got her. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Look at that. So. All cozy yeah. inside. These are from weather. These are called weather goods and they're from Sweden and good luck. Anybody trying to order those. Cause it's impossible unless you have somebody over there to yeah. ship them to you. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. my go-to feats, muffin, pogies, whatever you want to call them are wobs. Uh, and you can kind of see them right there. Yeah. The, as soon as it, as soon as it gets into single digits Celsius, these things go on my handlebars. I got them for each bike they kill the wind. They stop any precipitation from reaching your hands. And without them, I couldn't ride in winter. They're, they are essential enablers and you're going to spend about 30, $40 to get a pair and uh, probably another 30, $40 for shipping because you can only get them in the Netherlands. But there's a website called hollandbikeshop.com. And that is the only site that I know of that you can order them from. Shipping's expensive, so find some friends that want to order things as well. Yeah. But they have everything. They have all the goodies over that, e- that the EU has that nobody here in North America has to sell you. Um, nice. So, yeah, uh, WOBS, W-O-B-S, and that stands for Warm On Bikes. They're actually made out of 100% recycled materials. Uh, don't quote me on this, but I think it's an all women run company. Um, but, uh, really they're best for your swept back bars, uh, not really your straight bars. They work on turn as well. Kind of their, their bars, which aren't really swept, but Mm -hmm. aren't straight. Um, yeah, there you go. Um, absolute enablers. So get you some of those. They will, they will, they will keep your hands, your fingers safe. And then the other thing is. Oh yeah. This. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Order yourself a big box of hot hands. Take these things. If you're, if it's a particularly cold day, do what I do. I take two, shove one in each boot and I take another two and shove one in each glove. And it can be just absolutely freezing outside. And that helps keep my core temperature up and, um, uh, and going. And the other thing, which is just kind of a luxury, but people always love to ask me about this. Oh yeah. It's a wool seat cover. Right. And, uh, I don't know that it keeps you any warmer, but I don't know, sitting on a, uh, a saddle with a wool cover on it in the middle of winter just feels better than sitting on a, a regular saddle. Sometimes perception is everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we have one of those for each bike too. And yeah. again, that's yeah. something else that you can get from that hollandbikeshop.com. Yeah. Um, so those are my enablers. Now, if we want to talk a little bit more about there's, how to yeah, dress. There, there, there's, there's that there. You can see that nice there you go. saddle there. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and one question I get is, Oh, how hard is it to take your hands in and out while you're riding? Do you, do you lose, you know, I don't know. Some people think that, Oh, it's hard to get your grip back on the bar and the brake lever and everything. No, you get used to it really quick. And the other thing I want to talk about too, is just dressing. You don't need, you don't need big puffy gear. You don't need to look like that little kid on a Christmas story who gets all wrapped up in the big scarf and everything like that. Just, uh, just get yourself some wool socks, a good pair of boots. Um, I have two types of long underwear, one that's thick and one that's thinner. So I kind of rotate those depending on the temperature, but put on some long underwear, pair of pants, a hoodie, uh, and then scarf, gloves, and hat, all essential things and sunglasses. I have sunglasses and then clear ones. Whenever it's super cold, if the wind is hitting your eyes, they will just water and water and water. 
Yeah. You got to have something to block that wind and the cold. So some sort of yeah. glasses and that's it. Otherwise I look like a regular person. I don't, I don't look like I'm dressed up for winter biking. Right. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, just, it's a lot easier than people would think. Yeah. And, uh, and just to give uh, an acknowledgement to uh, JC who, who, you know, posed that question. Thank you so much, JC, for getting that out. What are key tips uh, for year round cycling? We appreciate that. And, uh, JC also uh, had a question about how well does uh, Carmel do when it comes to uh, actually managing and dealing with, you know, those types of snowy conditions and icy conditions, because that's another aspect of all of this is, you know, if, if the city's not doing a good job of making it, you know, very feasible for you and your wife and, you know, the children in the neighborhood to be able to get around by bike. Uh, and it's, and it's a treacherous, uh, in environment, then that's, that's a problem. So a, how well does Carmel do in, in helping facilitate this in terms of management? And, uh, and, and if you can think of any other good examples, cause I know you have, uh, the experience of, of riding up in Minneapolis too. So you do have an ability to do some compare and contrast. Yeah. Um, well, just a quick summarization or backstory. Uh, I moved to Carmel, Carmel, Indiana. If anybody wants to Google that, I moved here in 2021 to live a car light lifestyle. Um, it's the roundabout capital of the U S I got like 150 some odd roundabouts and keep building more every day to eliminate, uh, intersections. Um, and a, a very good off uh, off street network there uh, for bikes. There's, there might be a few stragglers, but there's no on street bike lanes in this town, uh, city, town, whatever you want to call it. hundred thousand people. Um, so they do a pretty good job. Um, but again, don't forget this is Indiana. So we're not, <laughs> yeah. we're not getting a lot of snow, but when we do, yeah. they hit the things like the Monon trail uh, really hard and really fast. I got to give them that. They do a great job of getting out and getting on that. But when it comes to the overall network that goes throughout the city uh, of multi-use paths, they're okay. I know yeah. that they try, uh, but they could do better, but they're, they're only okay. Uh, they get some main things cleared, but then they miss a lot. And, um, and then they do make the one mistake that every city in the U S makes that has winter. It's, uh, they might clear a path once like a multi-use path, but then they'll clear the street again. And you know how it makes that ice and snow blockade there. Um, so that nobody comes back and clears it by hand. It's like, if they, if they, if they can't clear it with their gator and their plow on there, well, it's not getting done. Nobody's going to get out with a shovel because apparently this country doesn't do manual labor anymore. But uh, yeah, that's 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 the one mistake that they make. But it's, I mean, it's not just them. It's everybody that gets yeah. snow in North America. The, these cities, they just don't know how to clean the conflict areas where a uh, bike path or pedestrian path meets car uh, uh, infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise they're trying. They do pretty good. They could do better, but they're, they're doing all right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, let's, ha let's have some fun. Let's see you, you, uh, you posted something out on Twitter, uh, uh, the other day that made me chuckle. It's like mm -hmm. <laughs> this, uh, what's the backstory on this? Uh, this yeah, I don't know. I, I, I find <laughs> a lot of fun tidbits, um, through my pre bed ritual. Like I'm laying in bed and I'm scrolling, uh, Reddit or some other mm -hmm. similar things. And this one was on the Amsterdam subreddit. Somebody had had posted a, a photo of this, just thought it was funny. And I think it's put up by Swap Feats. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I thought, oh, okay, here, let me take this photo. I'm going to crop it down just to the sign, post it. And maybe some of the people that follow me in Amsterdam or, or, or whatever will they'll want a nice little Easter egg to go hunt down. You yeah, know? yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if anybody did it, but, uh, I thought it'd be fun and it's a fun thing. That's, that's so cool. Yeah. Those are, those are kind of the things that we could look forward to here in North America. If we'd get our yeah. act together and, and have more of a active transportation infrastructure, we could have these, you know, these small little things that, that make things fun, you know? 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and the inside joke, uh, you know, to this, obviously with hammer time, uh, you know, dating back, I don't know how many decades in terms of music, but then you, you mentioned swap feats. The inside joke yeah. to that is the, the, the front wheel is, is blue and the tire is blue. Mm -hmm. Why don't you, ex yeah. why don't you explain that uh, for folks that may not be aware of swap feats? Oh yeah. Swap feats is a, is a bicycle subscription service in the Netherlands, but I think they've expanded to Germany and might be working their way into London. I don't know. Um, the front tire is always blue. You can rent uh, or subscribe to whatever um, an acoustic bike, which, you know, just your regular bicycle, you get the pedal or they have e-bikes as well. And um, if the, if it ever breaks down or if it ever gets stolen or something like that, you just, I think on their app, you can just report things or say, oh, my tire's flat and where's your bike and say where it is and say while you're at work or whatever, they'll come by and either fix it for you or swap out your bike for you and you'll be good to go. And you just pay a subscription fee uh, every month. So, uh, and you can always recognize them by the blue tire the blue, up front. The blue I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. No, are you kidding? That, I think it's, I, I always, when I'm over there, I just get a chuckle every time I see the uh, swap feet bikes out there. And uh, especially when I do see them servicing them too. And they, they, because that's the, the whole point of the name is if, if you've got sort of a catastrophic situation and it needs repair, uh, they will swap literally the just come and swap, swap that, swap that feet. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty darn cool. So, yeah. uh, we, uh, we, we had another question come in that I, I thought was, uh, is a little bit more personal in the sense that, uh, uh, somebody wants to know about your recent trip to, uh, Brazil and wanted to know how uh, that all went. So oh, I totally how, forgot. How to <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't see that. Um, yeah. So good? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There there one. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, it was him. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it went really well. Um, the, the fun thing now, well, uh, my wife is Brazilian. So yeah. uh, all the in-laws and everybody's over. You, you, you were visiting yeah. family. Yeah. Down yeah. in Brazil. Yeah. We were down there yeah. visiting family. Yeah. Uh, so it was good. It was nice to get down there and visit everybody and love the food and everything. And um, of course, now I go down there and I look at everything through um, my, my Dutch infrastructure eyes. evaluating <laughs> yeah. eyes. Yeah. Nice. And, and transportation. And, you know, you go to Brazil, you rent a car. Yeah. Well, you do. So, and it's, it's, it's frustrating. It's, it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's no different here, but, yeah. um, yeah, no. And I start to pay more attention to the occasional bike infrastructure and people on bikes and stuff like that. It's fun. I see a lot of, I see a lot of people using bikes out of necessity, um, mostly men. Um, and it looks extremely dangerous. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of cargo ish looking bikes, not, not, like the same ones we see around here, that market hasn't really developed down there, but they have their own, you know, at a rack or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of people doing stuff like that. You go to, if you go to Rio or Sao Paulo, um, there's actually a lot of uh, cargo bikes for business, um, uh, that you'll see down there. So yeah, the, uh, Brazil's fun. I don't know. It's, yeah. uh, it's probably not some people's, uh, cup of tea. They're probably more the, Oh, I want to go to Paris type. Uh, but, uh, South America is pretty cool. It's a little more rugged, but it's, I'm, I'm happy to be connected to it and involved with it. So. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, Hey, uh, we've got another one here. We'll pull this one down out of our faces again. Um, I need to figure out how to make that not go up there, but I'm not mm. going to be able to do that in the fly here. Uh, but, uh, this question also from JC, uh, wants to know if you could snap your fingers and make one or two instant magic changes to caramel, what would they be? I, I have two of them ready to go. Okay. Number one, <laughs> um, they need to knock it off with the double lane roundabouts. Shoot. You can probably watch episode number two with, with you and I, where I rant about double lane roundabouts, uh, double lane roundabouts have their time and place. Um, but Carmel puts a lot of them, um, too much towards the city center, um, where they, they shouldn't be there because that just works for level of service. Uh, yeah. for motorists and, and anytime you bring it up, they, 
they love to they love to just regurgitate their statistics and say, oh, but you know we uh, we have one of the lowest incident rates uh, of any city or whatever because of our roundabouts, and um, that might be. But there's nobody measuring lived experience of trying to cross double lane round, roundabouts on foot or on bike. It's it's bad. It's really bad. So snap my fingers. Double lane roundabouts within a kilometer and a half of city center, gone. So that's what yeah. I would change, number one. Uh, number two, um, Carmel's big on building parking garages and trying to eliminate big uh, things of uh, uh, paved parking lots, which is good. However, whenever they build these big parking garages, they're not eliminating a proportion of street parking. So I just, I see it all the time. There's a big parking garage over here, but these motorists, they'll just circle the block a few times until they can go find a street parking spot. Uh, and they'll just park there rather than using the parking garage. So I right. think another thing I'd snap my fingers, it would be every time you build a parking garage within a certain vicinity of that, you have to eliminate X number of street parking spots and only dedicate those to say handicap parking or loading and unloading zones. You know, we need to force people into these parking garages that we're paying for right. uh, and make them use them and get these cars off our streets and get the circling uh, lazy people off our streets and their wank panzers. Can I say wank panzer? <laughs> <I don't> no. <laughs> so yeah, that's a good, good point with the, the, the two lane roundabouts. Um, I mean, the problem I have with roundabouts is just that, is that in North America, the dimensions are typically built for primarily for moving motor vehicles at speed through there. And so the dimensions are off. The second thing is exactly what you're saying, is that they have been addicted to doing two-lane roundabouts, which make mm -hmm. them incredibly difficult to become safe environments for people walking and biking. Uh, even yeah. when you have the off street network of, of trails that you have, it's incredibly frustrating um, when you get to those crossings and you and I you know, sat at one of those crossings uh, not far mm -hmm. from your house and looked at the behavior, the driver behavior, because it all yeah. speaks speed. You know, the lanes yes. are wide, there's multiple lanes. And so they're coming at the roundabout at a much higher rate of speed. And so the design of the roundabouts is the problem. It's not only that but, they're two lanes, it's like they're, they're two. The, des wide the design lanes. is very much a problem. And, and I'm not, uh, I'm not an engineer. So, uh, but I still have enough knowledge that I can look at these and I know exactly what the engineer here in the U S was going for. And it's just malpractice in my opinion, um, that, that they're they're again, they're putting roundabouts with designs that, emphasize level of service and speed in downtowns you can see it in in how the the approach lane comes up and then as you turn into it or if you're going to go off to the next area um it's so wide that it's almost kind of slip laney if you know what i mean um there's there's no there's no tightening to direct and control and calm behavior and then the other problem i notice is um let's say you know i'm over here but the car comes up and they're only looking left because they want to see, okay, who's coming so that I can zoom in here. And they're not looking for anybody crossing from the other side. So there's so much just left looking motorists. They're never paying attention to somebody trying to cross. And it all comes down to design. We, we, if we designed it right um, and didn't have, you know, professionally bankrupt traffic engineers doing these things like we do here in Carmel and every other city in the U S um, we would get it right and we would get safety for everybody, not just your crash statistics of cars, which they love to pull out, but it would be safety for everyone. And we need to change that. And fortunately, the good thing is we've over-engineered these things. So we can, we can fix that really easy by taking away space. It's harder whenever you need more space to make proper changes. Well, we've used too much space. So we can just take that back if we want to make those decisions, but they don't, 
make those decisions yet and they think I'm overly critical about it. But that's the good thing. I don't work for the city. I don't work for anybody. <laughs> so I can just come along and I use the infrastructure. So I'm, I'm not, I, I don't have, um, I don't have any interest to come along and be critical. I just want to be safe and be alive and not have to worry about my wife or anybody else out there using it, you know? Yeah. So. So the, the next question from Jordan um, is, is actually just saying, you know, what are some things that need to be done to encourage more people to be able to ride bikes uh, to work and for errands? In Carmel. In Carmel. Yeah. Uh, um, and I guess hmm. something different other than the roundabouts. <laughs> so yeah. since we just talked about that. Shoot. That's a really good question. Um, hmm. Well, I know that I noticed that even even with all this infrastructure, we still have a we still have a riding a bike is recreation. Riding a bike is a sport mindset here in Carmel, just like here in the U.S., just like here in North America, and on and on. Um, yeah, geez. Uh, <laughs> We just need more people doing it. I don't know. I mean, Carmel does a pretty good job with putting in bike parking. We, they do an excellent job with putting in bike parking. I'm going to, I'm going to give them that. Um, and they're working to expand our network. Even where we have a few breaks in our multi-use path network, they are working on it and they know we need to do that. Um, but we just need more people to come here and move here. And by the way, anybody who's thinking about it, come on. I've already got, I've already had two people move here because of what they've seen of my media. And I've got another person um, coming this year who's moving to Carmel. Uh, but we just need more bikes as transportation people to move here. And you can do it. I, that's why I moved here. You can move here and be car light. Um, some people I know are car free. But we just need more people doing it um, and it, it'll catch on. So my answer, I think, is just more people doing that rather than going out for the the Sunday recreation ride. You know, let's be real. So, yeah. But there's there's cargo there's cargo ish bikes here. There's cargo bikes here and, and people are using them. And even people with those uh, those gazelle bikes, the new nice new ones that just have like a, a rear rack. Well, they're putting paneers on there and they're using them. Um, so yeah, we just need more people. Come on, people come on over. Yeah. 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 And, and it, it is a very, very um, comfortable environment to ride when you're on that off street network, which is a good part of the reason why you see so many people doing it. I love that photo. Yeah. yeah. And so speaking of, you know, you know, <laughs> encouraging more people to come and more people to get out on bikes more often. Uh, yeah, this is a beautiful photo. You just posted this recently. Uh, talk a little bit about what prompted you to get these out. Yeah. What is it? Uh, April now. So <clears throat> I spend most of the colder months as the lone ranger <laughs> out there, you know, going and getting groceries or wherever I'm going by bike. And, um, a lot of people can empathize with this, especially in North America. As soon as it gets a little bit chilly, um, you're the only one out there, you know, because everybody else who say, you know, thinks of bikes as just recreation and stuff like that. Um, they hang their bikes up upside down in their garage and they're done until it gets warm again. So you're by yourself and it, it really starts to get you down. I mean, when you're out there alone, um, just thinking, what am I doing? I'm, I'm the only one out here. It's yeah. not fun. Having more people on bikes makes things fun. So anyway, what was going on here was just the other day I was riding across town because I was going to pick up a car that I was going to borrow, uh, for, for a few days. And, uh, there were tons of people out and I just instantly felt better at, about my choice of riding a bike to go places rather than drive. Um, yeah, it's just so nice to see. And we have the, we have the infrastructure and people use it. It'd be great if they got off of this main Monon trail and explored more places and actually went and did life errands. But yeah, this is the gateway for them, I guess. Um, yeah, the tons of people out, it just felt really good to, to see more people on bikes. Um, yeah. So you're not alone anymore. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I think that's what's interesting too is, um, and maybe this is you know related to to Jordan's question too in terms of what are some things that the city can do to try to encourage more people to to be able to do more utilitarian trips is leaning into the strength of like a facility like this, the Monon Trail, because ultimately much of your utilitarian trips that you, you know, use, you, you lean on this because it's a key uh, spine to the rest of the network. And so being able to use a, uh, a multi-dimensional, multi-functional trail such as this, and that's the wonderful thing about multi-use pathways and trails is that they're not, they don't have to be just recreation or just, you know, utilitarian. They're both. And, you know, they, and they serve both quite well. And so when we see images like this of people out and getting, you know, getting some fresh air and some exercise, and maybe they are leaning towards just recreation right now, but that doesn't matter because it's a gateway drug. It's, it's basically getting them prepped for uh, understanding. And maybe that's where the city can help out. Is, and and your, your content helps out too because you point right. out that this actually does connect to meaningful destinations. For example, right here in this photo, that guy, as I was busy trying to get some photos, but I caught him out of the corner of my eye. He seemed, yeah. you see, he's smiling. Yeah. He seemed happy to see me or intrigued about maybe my bike. I don't know. Sure. Um, yeah. But that, that was cool. He he wasn't just like some people who just blank and stare yeah. and keep going. He he was he was I don't know. He's some mentally engaged with whatever I was doing. <clears throat> but anyway, when I'm using this bike or if I'm using the Bach Feats, the Urban Arrow, <clears throat> the one thing that I'm doing uh, just by living by bike is what I love is say coming back from the grocery store and I'll have the urban arrow filled up with grocery bags. And then when I meet these people on the trail who are out doing recreation, they see me. Right. And so when they pass me, they have to be thinking, you know, they, they just saw this bike and yeah. they saw everything in it. The, the, the guy had a bunch of groceries. They have to be thinking about that. So yeah. I'm doing, I'm doing advocacy just by, existing and doing my everyday life and exposing them to possibilities that maybe they didn't know before, which is afforded to me by uh, cargo bike design, you know? Yeah. So there's that. And then um, to compliment Carmel. So <clears throat> the Monon trail is absolutely essential for me. Uh, it is my artery. It helps me get places down South places up North. I mean, it connects cities. Right. Uh, but what's great is that where some cities fall flat on these rails to trails, they just have that artery. But then yeah. when you got to get off of it, you have nothing or you have a crappy sidewalk or something. No, Carmel made sure to put the little tentacles that come off of the Monon Trail. So you almost anywhere you go, you can exit it and you've got multi-use paths to go east, west or, you know, uh, wherever you're going next uh, to keep your network up. So yeah. the, the network is essential. You can have a great rails to trails, but it's not going to serve as transportation really. If as soon as you get off of it, you're dumped onto a strode. Yeah. Well, I don't have that problem here because they, they are working on that multi-use path network, which is a, which is a great tactic for North America, multi-use paths. If eventually you reach this critical mass of where they don't work sure. anymore, you know, but they, sure. they can work here. So basically they're just glorified sidewalks, but they're enabling. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that relates to a question that B. Lee uh, posed and we'll, we'll pop this over here and resize it. Um, <clears throat> and basically, uh, you know, B is saying, uh, you know, what about some of the other uh, neighboring cities? Are they uh, starting to expand mm. uh, the network? Yeah. Um, so I'm pretty lazy. I, I don't like to go, I don't go exploring too often. Uh, I don't go to another city unless I, uh, or town, unless I have an errand that I'm running. Right. right. I don't just go exploring cause I don't care to recreational cycle, but yes. Um, uh, cities like Fishers, Indiana, Westfield, Indiana, and other, um, local closely connected towns, they see the roundabouts. So they're building roundabouts. They see uh, the 
the multi-use paths that people are using. So they're putting in more of those. And uh, quite a few handfuls of towns, uh, you could get to and from Carmel via, you know, certain things that are similar to the Monon or multi-use path network. Yeah, yeah. you can absolutely go to Noblesville, Indiana or Fishers, Indiana, or, or I, I've, I ride to Westfield, Indiana to pick up things at this garden center and never touch a street other than crossing one, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So when one city really takes off and does something and does it well, other cities notice nearby and then they start to emulate that in their own infrastructure decisions as long as they can, you know, get some support and some money to make it happen. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I'll point out that, you know, the day that I rode up to, to visit you, I rode the 15 miles from downtown yeah. Indianapolis uh, yeah. on the Monon all the way up there. And so that's also very feasible. Uh, and, and actually it was quite fun and didn't really seem that far because there was so many interesting things to see along the way. And, and you did it on Brompton. And I did it on my Brompton. Yeah. I mean, that's a piece of cake on a Brompton. It's not, not any big deal. But, you know, there was like really cool stuff happening. There were ice cream shops along the way. Uh, There were, you know, there's a couple of really challenging crossings over some strodes. And and I've talked about that. Deadly ones. Yeah. Um, But yeah, it's very possible and, and, and it's very encouraging. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want to cover? I mean, we, we've been addressing questions uh, from the audience, but uh, anything that you want to talk about? Hmm. Well, <clears throat> I do know that in 2022, I came as close as I've ever come to shutting down what I do as far okay. as the American Feature Platform and advocacy. I I just reached this low where I just would wake up and I don't know no passion for it. I wasn't, I wasn't into it. And I would say that I I still kind of, I've kind of lost a little bit of it. And I think that's, I think that's indicative of being a feature. Uh, Mm -hmm. Even, even when you talk to Chris Bruntlett, I remember one time he said, uh, you know, the whole, the honeymoon of the Netherlands more or less kind of wore off on him. And he found himself being that fish in the fishbowl. And sometimes you know, no longer like, Oh, look at everybody cycling. Look at all this infrastructure, just being like, I'm on a bike and I'm trying to get somewhere and let's, you know, let's go. (laughs) And, and I, I'm just finding that I'm kind of settling into the whole, yeah, you know, I I use a bike as transportation. I like cargo bikes, but um, I do get burnt out on thinking about it all the time and talking about it all the time. And maybe I've lost a little bit of my passion, but I did notice that I can't really give it up because even when I thought I was going to shut everything down, I would, I'd be on my bike going to the grocery store and I just thought, Oh, I got, I got to take pictures of this. I got to share it with people because it's just something in me that, that I've been doing for so long that seems to work in advocacy. Yeah. It's crazy how just taking some photos of, of your bike loaded up with groceries and then posting it online with, you know, string a few decent words together or whatever, how much that resonates with people and motivates people and inspires them. And, and, and I, I get, I get DMS or emails or replies of people saying, you know, after seeing you do this for so long, I started doing it or we sold our car or we moved to this place or we bought a cargo bike or blah, blah, blah. blah." And that just kept me going. And uh, it just made me think, maybe I'm making a difference. And if, if I can do that by just living my life and, you know, gathering media and sharing it. And occasionally I think I'm somewhat gifted at putting some words together uh, on teaching an infrastructure lesson about something or, or just telling people how to accomplish something and it helps them. I guess I'll keep going. And I also, I see people when they like something or when they comment on something. And even if I don't get back to them or whatever, um, I know that they're there. And, and I kind of thought, well, I'd miss interacting with a lot of these people on a day to day basis. And fortunately that got me through my low time. And, um, uh, I'm still, you know, I've settled into this whole advocacy thing. Um, so that I'm not 
all gung ho like I used to be a few years ago, but uh, I keep it going and it's, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of, kind of like autopilot has said, I know yeah, what yeah. to do. I know how to say things. I know, you know, how to present things and I just keep doing it. Cause I think it's making a difference and, uh, just got to get more people out of cars. So if I can yeah. do that passively, I'll keep doing that. <laughs> So, uh, I, I put a post up, uh, a, a few days ago and you, you retweeted <clears throat> this particular post. And, uh, the reason why I, this actually, this post actually, even before I put it out, it reminded me of you. And the reason why it reminded me of you is because about a month or so ago, you started dabbling with, uh, with some AI types of images <laughs> and, and pulling some things together. Talk a little bit about that experience. What was that like, uh, you know, jumping in and, and playing around with that? And what was that, res- what was A, from your perspective, how satisfying it was to, to play with it? And then what was the response like from your audience and whether you thought it was positive, worthwhile, et cetera? Mm. Well, before I comment about the AI, what, yeah. I, what I loved about this was that your photo here or your rendering, I guess. It yeah, has I think it's, so I think many, it's a similar type of, uh, of platform program. Yeah, it's like it, it just has something. so many key yeah. design aspects in it that yeah. is a teachable moment if you talk about it and you break it down for people. And yeah. you do need some education to understand how to do that. Uh, but and and that's where like people like you and me and some others can do that for people and say, OK, look at this. And this is why this is good. And this is why this works. I just loved this rendering. It looked really neat. And there's, again, there's key design principles right here that should be studied and spread. Uh, beautiful. Anyway, yeah, no playing around with those AI things. That was just, that was just peak <laughs> boredom. And I bought some credits on mid journey and uh, I thought it was just, it was just fun to plug in some keywords and some cities and see what it would come up with because um, as humans, we have a hard time visualizing uh, some things outside of the way we see them now, which is why I never cared about any of this stuff till I went to the Netherlands and I got to see, right? But I think one of my played around with was like Lakeshore Drive in Chicago, uh, yeah. where I just took out all the cars and threw in some trams and trees and people. And um, it did a decent enough job that you could recognize that it was Lakeshore Drive in Chicago. And uh, I don't know, I thought it was just fun because while it's not photorealistic or anything, especially with my amateur word inputs, it was still enough that it could make you think. Like if you're familiar with Lakeshore Drive and the traffic sewer that that thing is, uh, you might have a hard time re-envisioning it. But if you could if you could just see what the AI came up with, uh, it really makes you think, wow, that could be something spectacular. I can kind of see it here. And, and I thought that was good. I thought that was a good tool, um, for helping with, with visualizations. Now, (laughs) when it comes to AI art or art, whatever you want to call it, um, boy, some people don't like it. Oh my goodness. They get, irrationally mad about these things and and I disagree with them and and that's fine <laughs> uh just don't use it for bad purposes but yeah but I I saw it as a tool if used in the right way especially when it comes to infrastructure design and um yeah I, I think I think it was nice especially when if you're somebody who takes the time to put in the proper word inputs and and really refine things. You could make some neat things that can help um, sway minds or the way people might see something, you know, it's hard to see past the sterilized gray uh, to visualize something different. So it's a fun tool and it could be, it could be used for something. Do you think you go back to it and play around with it some more? I mean, Me, could that be absolutely one of the tools? Not. No, okay. <laughs> no, okay. no, it was just, it was just fun. And I had no interest in spending more of my own cash on that, on that okay. thing. Okay. But uh, for somebody there, I mean, they, you know, somebody else out there who's more capable than myself could, could yeah. make something of it. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and we, you know, we actually interviewed, um, the better streets AI, uh, Mr. Katz, mm-hmm. and he was on and, uh, and that was one of the episodes and, you know, th- that was the whole kind of cornerstone of, of, you know, and it was the early stages of, of AI. Cause that was like almost a year ago now. So, yeah. Yeah. So you, it sounds like you're, you're still more along the lines of I'm out and about, I've got my camera, I'm going to snap something or pulling together funny, witty memes. Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I encourage, and, and I've, I think, I think I said this on the first podcast, the second podcast, if you use a bike for transportation and you have a social media platform and you have a, have a cell phone, uh, I don't care if you're picking up groceries, dropping your kid off at school or taking your dog for a ride, take pictures and share it with people because they just don't know that you can do these things. They don't know that certain bike types exist and it's the easiest advocacy you can do. Just take pictures, share it. Yeah. And like this one, this is, you, you, you're like, what Christmas in April? (laughs) Yeah. 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 We, we got, we got uh, yep. this new bridge here, and then there's one um, as you head towards Indy, but still in the Carmel yep. uh, jurisdiction. Uh, they had to replace these bridges that go over culverts or small streams or whatever, and it took a year. <laughs> they had us on two do two detours for a year, which uh, I won't I won't complain about that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. They just got opened up, and so this was my first time going across that, and I. Nice, yeah. nice and wide, um, yeah. not not constricted there. Beautiful, good infrastructure. And I think that's a good thing to to mention too, because you you sort of alluded to it earlier when you were referring to uh, the sidewalks that you know are basically a little bit wider, and so they are serving as multi use paths, uh, you know, in the rest of the neighborhood off of the the main drag of the Monon. In mm-hmm. that, that is something that we, we have to think about from a North American perspective for cities is that if you're going to be mixing different modes, wider, just think wider, <laughs> we do need to have more space. I mean, it is completely unacceptable to, to just rely on eight feet, you know, 10 feet. I mean, wider, you know, whenever anybody asks me, you know, and they say, you know, how wide and I'm like, yeah, wider. That solves the maintenance issue too, because, yes. well, why don't, why don't sidewalks get plowed of snow? Because it requires yeah. special equipment. Okay. Well, just make the sidewalks into Lighter. multi-use paths or whatever, big and wide, wide enough to accommodate some, some municipal worker in his pickup truck with a big plow on the front. Well, then yeah. we don't have an excuse anymore because he can just come on through in his F-350 and plow the stupid thing and then it's done. There's no saying, well, you know, we've yeah. got, we've got this bike gutter and then we've got these little um, delineators over here and it's this really constricted area. We can't get, we can't get equipment in there. Okay. Then make it wider so you can wider. get equipment in there. It's that <laughs> simple. The space, the space is always there. The money's exactly. always there, but the space is normally buried under cars. So just look yeah. under the yeah. cars. And if the money's not there, well, that's because you're spending too much money in cars. So take some money away from there. The money in space is not a, is not an issue. It never is. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I spend enough time in the Netherlands that I can, I can tell you definitively, they have mm-hmm. plenty of space, you know, they have plenty of facilities that are shared facilities with bikes and peds. And what are they? They're wider. If you go into Vondel Park, it's hugely wide and, and there's and lots why, and lots of people. Yeah. And, and let's go to Finland. Why does Olu, why do they yes. have such an, an amazing maintenance program? Because it's wide. They can yes. drive a big tractor through there multiple right. times every hour. Simple, done. Don't have to buy these, these small little, oh yeah, we bought this mini snow plow. No, forget that. Just use the, use the maintenance equipment you already have. Yeah. Uh, that saves money, right? But right. just make your bike and ped facilities wider. Wider. One word. Wider. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I pulled this. I wanted to pull this photo up because you had talked about. You mentioned uh, that the city uh, does a really good job on parking. You just recently uh, posted this particular uh, uh, tweeted this one out, and <laughs> your point that you were making is just don't overthink bike parking. The simple upside down staple. I don't even know the official name of those. Sheffield. 
there you go, Sheffield. Just keep it simple. If anything, start to think about spacing and whether there's enough room for some of our larger format cargo bikes uh, like the Urban Arrow and some of the other cargo bikes that are you're starting to see. Uh, so yeah. be mindful of those sorts of things, but they don't have to be you know super fancy. The Sheffield upside yep. down staple is all that's really needed. Make sure it's anchored well. Make sure it's a yeah. well lit area. Make sure that there's other aspects of of you know just normal security and safety concerns. Uh, but this is a, a wonderful location and a great example. So I'm glad you posted this. Uh, I think just yeah, yesterday. And, and this was this was early in the morning on a weekday um, yeah. on a site that is generally a recreational weekend uh, area for people to come. So yep. if if this would have been a Friday night, you know, during the summer, um, there wouldn't have been space to park another bike in there. I mean, just yeah. And just to be clear, back. when you're saying recreational, if I zoom in on this, this is the whole party area back here. I mean, this yeah, is on a weekend night. I mean, this is just absolutely chock full of people. And yeah, those that, bike racks yeah. are full. And yeah. there are bikes everywhere. Of course, yeah. that big building in the background, there is a multi-story parking garage for Correct. cars. Yeah. Uh, well, but uh, but in, on the first layer here, we know that there's also an indoor bike storage yeah. facility as well as a repair station uh, right which back Which nobody here. ever uses. Yeah, yeah which nobody <laughs> ever uses. Blows yeah. my mind. But okay. Brandon, it's been such a joy uh, catching up with you, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having me back on. Uh, we yeah. d I know we didn't have any like, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, you get a lot of really uh really smart and accomplished guests on your show. And I'm just, uh, some nincompoop running a Twitter account, but, uh, so I don't, I don't have any big projects to talk about, but again, <sighs> I think that what I do just kind of keeps advocacy fun. And I don't know. I hope people. Yeah, I don't like, don't, I would say just don't, sell, don't sell yourself short. I mean, the thing that I love about this type of work that I've been doing now for freaking over 30 years is that, you know, it takes everybody. It takes activists. It takes advocacy organizations. It takes dedicated, hardworking city staff to do things. It takes, you know, professionals and consulting firms to do these things. It takes leadership. It takes politicians to be able to, to you know, know that this is there. And so, you know, know that, you know, what you are doing matters and because you have created a, an amazing audience. And mm -hmm. just your story alone, your, your, your story and, and Tatiana's story as a couple too, is so inspiring to so many people. And, you know, the fact that you have this following out there, I'm just glad that you, you found, you made it through the, the low points in 2022. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad oh, that too. you did. I was worried about you there for a while and you, you and I <laughs> chatted a little bit over <laughs> WhatsApp about that. Um, yeah. But it's, I'm glad that you found a, a place where you feel pretty good about it because you're making a difference out there and it, it doesn't have to look like what anybody else is doing. You know, it doesn't have to be what Jason's doing. It doesn't have to do, be yep. what Mark is doing and it doesn't have to be what I'm doing. Um, yep. it's, it's what Brandon, where you find yourself there. And the only thing that, that I give you in terms of advice as, as an elder is just, find a way to, to, to be joyful and gleeful in it. Um, and don't let it impact your health and well-being because that's the key. Mm, yeah. None of this matters enough that it, yeah. it, that if it, it, if it gets you, gets you down or gets you feeling, you know, to where it starts compromising your health and well-being. That's the key. Yeah, and it's gotta be fun. And, and I will, and I will say something about that. I spent yeah. a, a lot of the time that I was building this account. I spent a I spent a lot of time being hard on myself because I thought, oh my gosh, okay, I, I need to make this like modacity. I need to make, I need to try to be more like Bicycle Dutch. I need to try to be more like, a, and, and, and I noticed that caused a lot of friction with me because I kept failing to try to be like a certain uh, advocacy account that meant a lot to me, right? Right, right. Until I finally realized, no, 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 no these people are all my inspirations and my, and, and people that teach me and, and keep me going and then fill my head with stuff that I can pass on to other people, more education or inspiration. 
And so I am like them, but with my own sprinkle of flavor on everything. So, so I learned from, you know, Chris and Melissa and and Mark and Bicycle Dutch and Jason and, and, and a bunch and you and a bunch of people that I, you know, I I could go on all day listing names, but I just take everybody else's that means something to me, process it through here and then spit it out on Twitter and, and then, and it helps people. So I've, I finally become comfortable with the fact that no, I'm my own thing, but yeah. I'm also a product of all these other people that, that really meant a lot to me along this way. Yeah. Yeah. And what I love about you too, is that you're, you're not afraid to like dabble and try, you know, mm-hmm. you're, you, 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 you thinking about your YouTube channel and, and, you know, getting out and, and getting out on yeah. pizza and, and doing that. What, what's the update on that? I know you wanted to take a little bit of time off and, and, and take some time away from it. Um, but you were, you did, you, you produced quite a few of them enough to yeah. know whether that's something that you'd like to go back to at some point in time or, you know, pop in and out of it on occasion. Yeah. Yeah. Jason really goosed me with that thing too. Cause he went and he promoted a, my first feats and video and I got like over 2000 subscribers as quickly as you could blink. Thanks, Jason. And, um, so then I felt obligated to like make more. I'm like, Oh crap. People are wanting stuff. Uh, (laughs) now I got over that. I still have like 2,700 subscribers on. Yeah. Yeah. I've got, I've got it up Um, right here. Yeah. You've, you've got 2,700 subscribers. You yeah. have a total of 57 videos because you have a bunch of videos uh, from the past as well. Yeah, a lot of them, yeah, they're kind of crappy, yeah. but there's something. But um, the whole setting up the tripod on the Bach feats and stuff is is something yeah. I'm going to keep doing and it's fun. But yeah. I'm not going to try to become somebody who can make money off of this. And I'm not going to yeah. keep drooling out videos every two weeks because I noticed that uh, two things. I hate editing and my laptop hates editing. Uh, so, <laughs> so the two of us have agreed that editing sucks. Um, yeah. but whenever I would make these videos, they're not, they're not like, not just bikes videos or other things like that. They're just kind of like me riding around and, um, having a talk show in my own little head and just talking about things and, and showing off Carmel. And, and I like the real time rides more rather than edited yeah. because I don't have to edit. Uh, but I, but I started to get messages from people, uh, saying, I really enjoy this. It's just kind of, I, I've had somebody say, oh, while I feed my kid breakfast, I've got it playing on the TV or, uh, you know, some people in the Netherlands, there's a lot of surprisingly a lot of people in the Netherlands who just like to watch them to see what it's like living and cycling somewhere else. And once I saw that people kind of enjoyed these unedited ride around videos, they do like the first person thing. So they like to see a face. Um, I thought, okay, I can do some more of those. But I took the winter off because winter in the Midwest is ugly and boring. But you know, as soon as we get some more leaves on the trees, I'll I'll, uh, and more people on the trails. I'll go out and um, yeah, yeah. capture some more and make some more. Yeah. Well, now that we know that, you know, some parents like to just put it on in the background and, and have the kids, you know, parked in front of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you may have to make sure you keep it PG. <laughs> oh, yeah, I do, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's hard to do, but I've been doing beeps. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. I still have one grandma that's living and she wouldn't like me cussing in front of a camera. So yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> try to tone it down. I love it. I love it. Well, again, Brandon, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast once again. I appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Thank you, John. Maybe we'll see you again in 2024 if there's something to talk about. (laughs) Absolutely. Let's plan on it. (laughs) All right. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Brandon Lust, the American Feetzer. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below, and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, we honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on the subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. Uh, and if you are enjoying this content, please consider becoming an Active Towns Ambassador uh, by joining our Patreon. Uh, Pop on over to the Active Town store for your own Streets of for People swag. And uh, yeah. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.
And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.